In this video, we're going to find all of the relative extrema for three functions. Um, and we're also going to determine on what intervals are these functions increasing or decreasing. So for our first example, we have the function f of x equals 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 72x plus 15. So that we have this polynomial function. If we're looking for the local or relative extrema, we know that by Fermat's theorem, these will occur at either endpoints if we have a closed interval, which we don't, or they'll happen at the critical numbers. The critical numbers are those numbers which make the first derivative go to zero or make the first derivative undefined. So the first thing we need to do is calculate the first derivative here. By the usual power rule, we're going to get that the first derivative is equal to 6x squared minus 6x minus 72. The derivative of a constant goes to zero, so I'll just disappear. And so this derivative itself is a polynomial. It won't be undefined anywhere. So we just need to figure out when is the first derivative equal to zero to help us find uh, these critical numbers. So we have this quadratic equation we're trying to solve. We're going to do this by factoring if possible. If not, we could use the quadratic formula. Um, we do notice that the coefficients 6, 6, and 72 are all divisible by 6. You can factor out the 6, leaving behind x squared minus x minus 12. Now we need to find factors of 12, negative 12 that add up to be negative 1, um, for which we can do negative 4 and positive 3. So we factor this as x minus 4, x plus 3 equals 0. And so now we found two critical numbers. We have positive 4 and negative 3. If there were any domain restrictions, we would have to check right now to make sure that these numbers are inside the domain. But as it's a polynomial, the domain is all real numbers. Uh, no issue with that. So we're gonna. What we have to now do is test whether these critical numbers are local extrema or not. Just because you have a critical number doesn't mean it's necessarily a maximum or a minimum. We need to test it, and we're gonna test this using the first derivative test. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a sign chart. You want to think of this line on the screen right now as like the x-axis, and we're gonna mark it based upon these critical numbers. We have negative three and four. So what we've done is we've taken the x-axis, the real line, and broke it up into three pieces. There's the interval negative infinity to negative three. There's the interval negative three to four. And then there's the interval four to infinity. And so we've broken up the x-axis in these three pieces. So we what, what we want to do is now on these three intervals, we want to determine whether the derivative is positive or negative. So what can we say about the derivative here? So if you take, for example, the interval negative three to four, how can we decide if uh, the derivative is positive or negative on that? Now, one thing important to note here is that to build this sign chart over here, we're using the intermediate value theorem. Uh, that is to say that because we know that the only places that the derivative is equal to zero is at four and negative three, these are the only critical numbers, we know by the intermediate value theorem, because the derivative f prime is itself a continuous function, the only time it can change signs is at an x-intercept, aka these critical numbers. So if I pick any point, any number, between negative three and four, and I put that into the first derivative, that will be the sign for every number. So for example, what if I take the test point x equals zero? Well, we can actually do the derivative at zero. We end up with a negative 72. Notice that is in fact negative. And so we're gonna record that the first derivative is negative if we're between negative three and four. And it doesn't matter which test point you use. If you had instead done the first derivative at one, we end up with six minus six. Those just cancel out. Uh, gives you a minus 72. That's likewise going to be 72 again. Um, we could have done f prime at two, right? That's a little bit more of a calculation we'd have to do there, but we would see that that's going to be less than zero. It's going to be negative. Again, by the intermediate value theorem, since the first derivative is continuous, um, any number between any any value any number x you pick between negative three and four if I put that into the first derivative and we are putting it into the derivative here it doesn't matter between negative three and four if you choose it it'll be all of them are going to be turn out to be negative here um, what about something bigger than four well if you want to you can take x to be five whole numbers are good we want to pick if you're picking a test point we want to pick one with like easy arithmetic so five is pretty good I also like ten. Uh, because it's, it's a polynomial function, we have to take powers of 10. Powers of 10 are pretty easy. 10 squared is just going to be 100. Times by 100 or 1,000. Pretty easy. We can probably figure it out. Um, honestly, though, 
I like to do as little arithmetic as possible. So if I want to take a test value, it's a secret here. I'll use infinity because uh, it's a lot easier to figure out what's going on here. Because with the polynomial function, if you take the limit as x approaches infinity, then only the leading term matters. So what happens to the quadratic as x approaches infinity? Well, what happens to 6x squared? 6x squared will approach infinity. In particular, it's a positive infinity. So we see that this side here is going to be positive. And then by similar reasoning, if we take the limit as x approaches negative infinity of the derivative, um, we get 6x squared. It's a positive leading coefficient, has an even degree. So as x approaches negative infinity, uh, y will still approach positive infinity. So we get this, plus, minus, plus. And so... Filling out this sign chart is exactly what we do to help us determine what's going on here. But I also want to mention another approach that you can use in this situation that we don't just have to use these test points. Um, one strategy that some people like to use is to use a factorization here. So if we just consider the factors of the derivative, x minus 4 and x plus 3, we found these factors because, well, we needed them to find the critical numbers. But if you look at them just as by themselves, it's just a linear function, y equals x minus 4. This is a linear function with a positive 1 slope. Therefore, this function is going to be increasing as you span the x-axis. It'll start on the negative side, and it'll end with the positive side. When does it switch from negative to positive? Because a line will only do it once. It'll switch at its x-intercept, which is in this case, 4. So it's going to be below the x-axis until you hit 4, and then it'll be positive afterwards. So notice, if I have this linear factor, I can fill in this sign chart without any calculations whatsoever, negative, negative, plus. I don't need, I don't need to do any arithmetic there. Uh, and then if you take the line y equals x plus 3, the other factor in the derivative, then again, it's going to start off negative. It'll switch to pause when you hit its x-intercept, which is negative 3. So you get uh, negative, positive, positive. In which case, then the first derivative is the product of these two things. I mean, there's also a product of six, mind you, but as it's positive six, that's not going to contribute much. And so notice what happens here. When you're less than negative three, you're going to have a negative times a negative. That's going to be a positive. When you're between negative three and four, you get negative times positive, which is a negative. And when you're greater than four, you get a positive times a positive, which is, is equal to a positive. So if you use the factorization of the derivative, then you don't have to use any of these test points, which the test points aren't so hideous, but it avoids a little bit of arithmetic, um, which honestly is the hardest part of calculus. So that's its alternative strategy that I will suggest to you. We'll see this on the subsequent examples in just a moment. So however you want to fill out this sign chart, a one third approach I'll mention as we're trying to graph a parabola, we know the basic graph is going to look something like this. It has an x-intercept at negative three, has an x-intercept of four. It's a concave up parabola because the leading coefficient is positive. So we know the graph of this parabola is going to look something like this. So it's going to be, um, it's going to be positive, negative, positive. So again, there's a couple ways you could try to fill in this sign chart. Now that we've now that we've identified the signs of the derivative, we then can infer from the signs of the derivative the monotonicity of the original function f. Because but whenever the derivative is positive, that means that the function is going to be increasing. Whenever the derivative, first derivative is negative, that means the function will be decreasing. And again, when it's, it's when the first derivative is positive, that means the function's increasing like so. So we basically see that our function is going to be doing something like the following. It's going to be going up, then it's going to be going down, and then it's going to be going down, and then it's going to be going up. So what does this tell us about our critical numbers, negative 3 and negative 4? We see that negative 3 is going to turn out to be a local maximum, and we see that 4 is going to turn out to be a local minimum. So let's summarize the information that we've discovered so far here. So what we know is the following. We see that f is increasing. It's increasing on the interval negative infinity to negative 3 union 4 to infinity. Uh, we see that f is decreasing. It's decreasing on the interval negative 3 to 4. We have so f has a local max at the value x equals negative 3, and it has a local min at the value x equals 4. 
So we all determine all of this information uh, using the first derivative, that is the first derivative test. Let's look at another example. This time we don't have a polynomial function, but it is still a linear combination of power functions, so it'll be very similar in nature. Let's figure out where are the local extrema of this function, where is it increasing, where is it decreasing? So we'll start off with the first derivative. By the power rule, we're gonna get the first derivative f prime is six times two thirds times x to the negative one third. That's a one right there. And then you're gonna subtract from that four. Uh, now this one we have to be a little bit more careful about because we do we do want it to see when it's equal to zero, but we also are interested in what makes it undefined. Because you have a negative exponent here, that actually does mean division. And so we can see there are going to be some values that make this thing undefined. So let's try to write the derivative as a fraction next. Um, some things to note. Three goes into six, of course, two times. So it leaves you a two. Two times two gives you a four. Um, we can factor out a four since that's a common coefficient. I'm also gonna factor out x to the negative one third power. What does that leave behind? Well, we took away the four, we took away the x to the negative one third, so it gives us a one right there. And then we subtract from the, from the negative four that we factor out the four, and then we also divide it by x to the one third. So if you divide by a negative, it actually gives you something positive. And so rewriting it, we see that the first derivative looks like uh, four times one minus x to the one third power. That's just the cube root there. And this sits above x to the one third power. So what makes the denominator go to zero? That's an important thing that we have to identify here. Because if the denominator goes to zero, that makes the expression undefined. You have x to the one third equals zero. If you take the third, if you cube both sides, take the third power, you're going to get x equals zero. And so this is going to be a critical number. And we can actually see that this is going to correspond to a vertical tangent line. A vertical tangent. We're also interested in what makes the numerator go to zero. Because if the numerator goes to zero, that actually makes the whole fraction go to zero. And that's gonna coincide with a horizontal tangent line. So we get four times one minus x to the one third power equals zero. Divide both sides by four, we get one minus x to the one third power equals zero. We'll just move the cube root to the other side. So we get the x to the cube root, uh, that is the one third power equals one. If we cube both sides, we're gonna get x equals one right here. And this is gonna coincide with a horizontal uh, tangent line. So recording what we've discovered here, we have two critical numbers. We have x equals zero, and x equals one as our critical numbers. So now that we have our critical numbers zero and one, let's investigate uh, the monotonicity of the graph. We're gonna build a sign chart based upon our first derivative. So we're gonna leave that on the screen as we draw this thing. So we have zero and we have one. So let's consider the factors of f prime here. So one of the factors, uh, we can ignore the four because it's just a constant positive four there. One of the factors will take one minus the cube root of x here, like so. And the other factor, we're gonna take y to be the cube root of x, like so. So can we figure out what's gonna go on with this function right here? Let's take the cube root of x for example. This is a graph we know very well. Um, the graph of this thing looks kind of like the following. This function is always gonna be increasing uh, but it'll switch from negative to positive once you hit its x-intercept, which will happen at zero. So we see that our function here is going to go from negative, it'll be positive, positive for the remaining intervals. Uh, what about the function y equals 1 minus x to the cube root? Uh, well, in that case, if we think about it in terms of transformations, the negative sign here, what that does is it's going to reflect the graph. So now the cube root is gonna look something like this. And then the plus one shifts everything up by one, changing the x-intercept, but this is what we need to see here. It's gonna go from positive to negative, uh, negative there. So in particular, this thing will look like positive, positive, negative, like so. And so if we put this together, the first derivative, f prime, we see that when you look at the combinations, a positive and a negative gives you a negative, a positive and a positive gives you a positive, and a negative and a negative, excuse me, a negative and a positive gives you a negative. So this gives us the signs of the first derivative for which then we can infer the monotonicity of f. We see that f is going to be decreasing, then increasing, then decreasing on its domain. So if we summarize what we've seen here, so it's the f is decreasing 
it's decreasing on the interval negative infinity to zero, union one to infinity. So notice I got information. So I want everything to the left of zero, that's negative infinity to zero. I want everything to the right of one, that's gonna be one to infinity there. And we know that the function is increasing. It's increasing on the interval zero to one. What about its extrema? F has, what can we say about these critical numbers? Well, if the function was decreasing, but then becomes increasing, that's an example of a local minimum by the first derivative test. And if it was increasing then decreasing, that means our function was a has a maximum at x equals one. So let's say this here, f has a local minimum at the value zero, x equals zero, and it has a local maximum at x equals one, like so. Now we were able to figure out this, fill out this sign chart using factorization of the derivative. If you wanted to, you could just use test points. Uh, for example, you could pick something larger than one, uh, something between zero and one, and then something less than zero. You could do that, but admittedly, there's no whole numbers between zero and one. So, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna use test points, I'd probably do something like let's perfect q to be good. So let's say like x equals eight if you're above, x equals negative one in this interval. You could do like x equals one eighth. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a perfect cube fraction. So you could use that one uh, to help you fill out the chart if you prefer using the arithmetic, uh, this, this arithmetic approach of test points like we did on the previous example. Let's finish this video with one more example here. Let's find the intervals of monotonicity for f of x, this time to equal x times e to the two minus x squared. We do have to calculate the first derivative. Uh, the product rule is gonna come into play this time. We take the derivative of x, which is one, then we get a e to the two minus x squared. Next, we're gonna get x times the derivative of e to the two minus x squared, which when you take the derivative of natural exponential, you get back itself. But the chain rule comes into play and we take the inner derivative, which is gonna be negative two x, like so. Uh, and so this is our derivative. We want to set this equal to zero. Notice that when you look at this function, it's just a bunch of power functions and exponentials. There's no place where it's going to be undefined. Uh, so we just have to figure out when it's equal to zero. So we need to factor this thing. The first thing to recognize is that both of these have these powers of e, both of the terms there. So let's factor out the power of e. Uh, so we're going to get e to the two minus x squared. That leaves behind a one plus x times negative two x right there for which keeping the exponential still there, we get one minus two x squared this is equal to zero. Now, one great thing about exponential functions is that exponentials, if you take e to any power, whatever you want, what's called theta, this can never equal zero. In fact, these exponentials are always positive. So there's no way that the exponential factor could equal zero. It must in fact be the case that one minus two x squared equals zero, which if we add two x squared to both sides, we get one equals two x squared divide by two, we're gonna get x squared equals one half. And therefore our critical numbers are twofold. We get that x equals plus or minus the square root of one half, which if you prefer, you could write that as plus or minus one over the square root of two or plus or minus the square root of two root over two. These are all the same number. It really kind of comes down to if you like rationalizing uh, denominators or, or such. If you want to approximate it as they are irrational, you get plus or minus 0 0.707 like so. And so we're going to build our sign chart based upon uh, this idea right here. Let's draw that one. So we're going to mention our critical numbers. So we have negative the square root of one half or negative 0 0.07 if you prefer. And then we're going to have positive the square root of one half like so. And we want to think about the first derivative. If you're going to approach it using factorization, notice that e to the two minus x squared is always positive, so it's never gonna change the sign. If you're using factors, it would look like one minus the square root of one half x, and then y equals one plus the square root of one half x. You could do that one, but again, I don't really wanna use irrational numbers if I don't have to. Uh, we could use a test point, like you could use x equals zero, it's over here. We could take something bigger than the square root of uh, one half, it could be like x equals one, x equals negative one. 
negative one and put that into the first derivative and calculate those things. I'm gonna use the fact that the, essentially it looks like a parabola and you know there is a factor of the exponential, but that's always positive. I only care about the signs. It looks like it's an upward parabola, excuse me, it's a, it's a concave down parabola because of the negative coefficient there. So I can see that the first derivative the sign chart is gonna look like negative, positive, negative. Which then, what does that mean about the function f? It means that we were decreasing, then we were increasing, and then we were decreasing. So in particular, when you approach the negative square root of one half, you go down and then up. So that suggests we have a minimum. And then for the square root of one half, you are increasing and decreasing, so that means you have a maximum. So let's then report then what we found for this function here. So f is increasing, it's increasing on the interval. We're gonna take negative square root of one half to positive the square root of one half. And it is decreasing on the interval. This time, we're gonna get negative infinity all the way up to negative the square root of one half. Union, we get positive square root of one half up to infinity. That's where it's decreasing. We see that f has a local minimum at the value x equals negative square root of one half. And we see that it has a local maximum at the value x equals the square root of one half. And so we've then demonstrated in this video how we can um, find the local extrema of a function using the first derivative test.